Welcome to the Eating at a Meeting podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Stuckrath, dietary needs expert, certified meetings manager, certified food protection manager. I have searched the globe to find people and businesses who are creating safe, sustainable, and inclusive food and beverage experiences for their employees, guests, and communities. In each episode, you will find authentic conversations about how food and beverage impacts inclusion, sustainability, culture, community, health, and wellness. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're going to cover it all. Are you ready to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line? If so, let's go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Eating at a Meeting. I am your host, Tracy Stuckrath. I am excited to be introducing you to Miss Monica the back way, Watros, who is the managing editor of Food Business News. And as that editor, she covers the latest trends, innovations, and developments in the food and beverage industry. She's a lifelong foodie and a champion of startups and disruptors in the consumer packaged goods landscape. So all that packaged food that we eat in the grocery store, she loves to tell us all about that. So hi, Monica. Hi. And I don't know if you, this is my microphone is picking this up, but there's a tornado siren happening right now. Oh, no, can't I'm hear safe. It. It's all good. It's just a warning. <laughs> but I don't know if that was like going to alarm well, anybody. Well, let us know if you need to go somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much for having me. This is great. I'm so excited. And because a couple of weeks ago, I had Larry and Adam Molajewski talking about food and beverage trends from the hotel side. And so I, I really want to turn it around and really see you know, I saw a great post that you did about a speech you gave recently on trends in the industry. And I think that was the baking show, right? Yes. But I really want to bring it back to what food and beverage we can see coming out. And one question before I forget, I'm like, do they change by quarter? Do they change? You know, how does, how do you see those changes? So just throw it at us. What do you see right now? Sure. So I would say that, I mean, I think people define trends versus fads, you know, versus macro forces in different ways. And it's, you know, not really clear. But in my mind, when I look across the consumer packaged goods landscape, there are four macro forces that are sort of defining the innovation that's coming out into the market today. And when I talk about innovation, I'm talking about that sort of cutting edge, the type of products that you would see at Expo West. So not necessarily something that the mainstream is eating, but maybe viewed as more aspirational, sort of like what you might see carried in Whole Foods or some of those those types of grocery stores. But I think also kind of trickling into mainstream and mass merchandise because Target is wanting to get more involved. Walmart's wanting to get more involved with these brands and with uh-huh. this type of innovation. So the four macro forces that I see that are really influencing all of this. The first one being sort of food with function. So not only are consumers expecting just sustenance and nourishment from food, but they're also looking for some sort of additional health benefit. So we're seeing a lot of foods that are that are being launched that contain things like adaptogens, which are substances like herbs and botanicals that are meant to regulate the body's response to stress. Mm-hmm. And the leader that's popping up everywhere right now is ashwagandha. And okay. that's sort of a fixture of Ayurvedic medicine. So it's it's one of those things that has this, this great history and credibility to it versus something like CBD, which, you know, popped up in some food and beverage formulations over the past few years, but doesn't really have that whole regulatory sort of, you know, credibility going for it, still kind of murky on the regulatory landscape and a lot of consumer acceptance issues as well. So ashwagandha is showing up in anything from baking mixes to ready beat cookie dough to snack bars to trail mix. I mean, just you name it, it it probably exists. I actually just looked it up for my mom like two weeks ago. <laughs> it's really interesting. And, and I, you know, I have to say, I probably consume a lot of these products that contain it. I don't know if I'm personally experiencing any benefits from it or if it's psychosomatic. Um, But, you know, usually when it's in a formulation, it also comes with other sort of health promoting features that are appealing to me as an eater. So, you know, things that uh, might be made with certain sweeteners or Mm -hmm. certain oils, that sort of thing. So I would say that is the first trend, but also it's not just limited to adaptogens and nootropics, which help sort of boost cognitive performance, but also digestive health. We're seeing a lot of innovation around that. There's a really interesting brand that I'm writing about called Super Gut, and it's a line of 
uh, like shake pow- shake mixes and bars that are formulated with this proprietary blend of resistant starch, which is really a key into tapping into the gut microbiome and sort of feeding the good bugs, right. I guess. And that, as we're learning, the science is still evolving, but that the gut microbiome is really foundational to overall health. There's right. the gut brain access, access there. There's a lot of benefits that impact mental health, inflammation, all kinds of things. So, so I think that that's a pretty powerful force in food and beverage innovation. And I expect to see a lot more of that. And consumers are here for it. They, in a recent survey with the, from the Inf- International Food Information Council, yep. consumers indicated I, it was a good percentage. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think it was, I mean, it was a significant percentage of people who were actually consuming more food and beverage products with functional benefits Mm -hmm. in 2021 than they even were in 2020, which is when we saw a lot of interest in like immunity and and things like that. So I think the trend is here to stay. I think people are now sort of expecting more from, from their products. So that's the first trend. Uh (laughs) I could get, I'll, I'll go through the the next three a little bit quick, more quickly. So sustainability is obviously a huge driver of innovation and that, you know, I mean, that's taking shape in anything from plant-based to carbon neutral. We're seeing like I heard this this term carbon is the new calorie. And I think that's a pretty interesting way to kind of frame all of the, the consumer interest, whether they understand right. what, you know, some of these claims mean in terms of like emissions or, you know, carbon footprint, they are certainly interested in supporting brands that are protecting the planet in that way. Right. So one of the really the most compelling examples of sustainability driven innovation, and I think we'll probably talk about it a little bit later when we we talk about what we saw at Expo West, Mm -hmm. um, but that would be upcycling. And I think, I I mean, this is, it's something that's existed in the food and beverage industry and certainly in the hospitality industry because chefs are very focused on stretching their margins and using every ingredient they can. And, you know, whether that's like the parts of a plant that normally get tossed in a consumer's home, but they'll figure out a way to incorporate it into a dish to really stretch out their ingredients. In the case of packaged food, what that looks like can be anything from like a, say a beverage that incorporates the leftover whey from yogurt production Mm -hmm. to like snacks that are made from ugly fruits and vegetables that would normally be thrown out to, oh, like... There's some really interesting spent brewer's grain is another example uh-huh. where, when, you know, in beer production, the leftover mash actually turns out to be a lot more nutritious than the part that gets extracted to make the beer. So right. it's a really fiber, like prebiotic fiber rich and protein rich leftover that was normally being fed to pigs or like tossed in a landfill. Right. And now it's being incorporated into consumer brand branded products. So, so I think that that's a really interesting trend that's here to stay yep. within that whole sustainability message. And then a couple other trends or macro forces that are influencing innovation, I would say, are alternative diets. People are taking very individualized approaches to wellness, right. and that could look like a number of things. It could be keto. It could be plant-based. It could be gluten-free, not because it's medically necessary, but because they think it's going to help them control inflammation or other mm-hmm. have other health benefits. So, And then, of course, I mean, those are the people who are doing this by choice, but then there's also a significant number of people who live with food allergies who who really need this innovation. And so we're seeing a lot of grain-free formulations that are made with things like cassava flour or yep. tiger nut flour, which tiger nut is, is actually, yeah, it's an interesting, it's not a nut. It's I, it's a like a tuber. It's a tuber. It's like, oh. a, but it has a prebiotic fiber. And so it's, there's a, there's a brand I really love called Mly. That's M-M-M-L-Y. Okay. <laughs> and it's a cookie brand that tiger nut flour is the, the primary ingredient there. And it's a grain-free cookie. And then I would say the last thing is cultural integrity or cultural exploration. And that it's kind of a twofold thing where basically the the American population is diversifying more quickly than predicted and four out of 10 Americans identify as non-white, but they are not seeing themselves represented or perhaps misrepresented on retail yeah. shelves. And so founders are taking it upon themselves to start businesses that incorporate, you know, the ingredients from their childhoods or the mm-hmm. flavors that they're not seeing in the grocery store already. And so we're seeing a lot of really cool innovation around, you know, like anything from prepared frozen meals to condiments to snacks that incorporate ingredients that Americans may not quite be familiar with, but that deserve to be that, you know, in in our diets Mm -hmm. and um, and should definitely be on retail shelves. So I would say those are kind of the big forces that, you know, a lot of other trends kind of ladder up to. 
No, and I love them. And I'm seeing those as well. And even I was at the national, the North Carolina restaurant and lodging association event on Monday night. And the chef that won, he's like Oscar Johnson. He's out of Charlotte. And he was like, oh my God, people love the food of my people. Right. And it was just, it, I actually didn't get by his booth to taste it. So I don't know what it was, but I know it had some grits in there and, and things, but he's just this, I, I saw him the next day and is just powerhouse. And he's, he started with the food trunk and now he's going to have a, a retail location. Right. And just kind of doing that. And I think that's a really big trend is understanding the food culture. Because yes. it's such a different aspect of it, of what we're seeing. And I think there was a lot of that. In, what's the great brand that, oh my goodness, I can't believe I can't remember. He got, he, Jennifer Garner was supporting him. Oh, I'll think of it. But they've got beans. Oh, a dozen cousins. Yes, a dozen cousins. Thank yes. you so much. Yes, yes. a dozen brand. cousins. Great brand, great food. I had some of their stuff. I bought their stuff and it's really, really yummy. Mm -hmm. But I was at that upcycling session at, at Natural Products Expo West, mm -hmm. Expo West. And the one guy that I talked to that was interesting is that he's taking the cherry pulp that's used to make cherry juice. Yes. And he's like, but nobody knows what to do with it. Right. right. And so that's one of the challenges, I think, with that upcycling, too, is that people are like, OK, manufacturers are trying to figure out how do I use that? Right. Sure. Yeah. Well, and there's a, yeah, there's a lot of creativity and a lot of innovation in figuring that out. But I think, you know, like as with the example of the spent beer grains, mm -hmm. a lot of the product that, you know, the upcycled ingredient itself carries so much nutrition and, yeah. you know, that value needs to be brought back into the, yep. you know, the human food system. Yep. And I think that you, and if to explain it to people too, is like, okay, if you have, I have a Vitamix and I have a juicer, right? And the Vitamix, you put the whole thing in and it's juicing with some liquid help, um, pulverizing it and juicing it up. But when you put it in the juicer, you get the leftover pulp from right. that and don't throw that pulp away, throw it on a salad or throw it in a cupcake or something like that. Right. Right. A muffin, probably not a cupcake, but you know, that's kind of that thought process of upcycling. So to put it in a different perspective. Right. And, and that pulp has all of the fiber in exactly. that fruit. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, not only is it, are you providing food waste, but you're finding ways to get those nutrients back into right. your body. Exactly. Exactly. So besides the brands that you mentioned, do you have any other examples of, of brands that you really like? Oh, I have, <laughs> I, have I like lot. so many brands. I, I made a little list in case I forgot. Well, so, okay, here's, so one that, you know, going back to that juicing example that mm -hmm. you gave, there's a, a company called Pulp Pantry okay. and they make like tortilla style chips out of the celery scraps and kale scraps of industrial juice processing. So like Evolution Fresh makes their cold press juices and they end up with like heaps of, the, the actual fibrous pulpy leftovers from wow. the juice product. And so pulp pantry like gathers that collects it, puts it in these chips. And so mm -hmm. the chips, you know, again, per, you know, reducing food waste, but also delivering all of these amazing mm -hmm. nutrients in a snack that is, it's really delicious. So, yeah. so that's a brand that I, I really like. And actually she was on shark tank uh, of that brand and Very I, cool. and Mark Cuban made an investment. So, Oh, nice. Yeah. So that's one I really like. Midday Squares is an interesting brand that is getting a ton of buzz. It is a, it's, it's built as a functional chocolate brand. And basically it is like sort of a hybrid between a protein bar with like a layer of chocolate on top, really clean ingredients. But what I think what's really compelling about the brand itself is the founders, because yeah. as they were starting to launch this, they decided early on that they wanted to hire a videographer to document this whole experience of launching and scaling a business, all of the sort of hiccups and hijinks that happen along the way. And so these three founders have become personalities in a sense. And they it's just a really interesting story. It's a great product. They have three SKUs. It's, you know, there's a peanut butter one, an almond one, and just like a regular kind of brownie fudge mm -hmm. one. But yeah, it's just, it's an interesting brand to watch in that they have really had some really early success, and, but also just the way that they approach it, I think is inspiring a lot of other brand founders. Okay. Awesome. 
And so thinking, let's jump to upcycled Mm -hmm. because there was a booth for upcycled. There was the education session, but either what upcycling had that booth and are there any products do you like in that whole marketplace there? Yes. Upcycled. Yes. So one of, one of my favorites that was represented there is called Kaju Love. Okay. C-A-J-U. And Basically what it is, it's a single ingredient product, but it contains the leftover part of the cashew. It's like the cashew fruit or cashew apple Uh that is normally discarded when cashews are harvested. The nut part is harvested. I remember seeing them. Yeah. And it's really interesting because you can actually use that part of the plant to make this really great meat alternative. And they, they sell it just unseasoned, the single ingredient, you can shred it, you can cube it, and it takes on the flavor of whatever you season or marinate it with. And so I thought that was a really interesting product. I really like that brand. And oh, Reveal is another, Mm -hmm. uh, which is the avocado seed tea. So basically a couple of grad students created, they were looking for ways to reuse the seeds from all the avocados that you know, we millennials consume. (laughs) And and they found that if you sort of brew it like a tea, you're getting all of these antioxidants and all of these benefits, but also you can then like compose, like it's easier to to compost or, you know, like the the seed itself after that process becomes Mm -hmm. basically like it kind of like just it's a lot easier to break down versus like a regular seed. It's just, you know, there's nothing you can do with it. It just fills up the landfill. So, so it's a healthy beverage, but again, also has that food, food waste reduction benefit. Okay. Awesome. Those are, I remember seeing cashew love. And I mean, the fact that cashews themselves are great for vegan products. I mean, they can take on cheeses and I mean, I've put it in, used it in lasagna. Nobody knows that it's not dairy, right? Because I sure. just, I think that, that I love the fact that they're doing all of that too. How are how are these products dis, in these these trends decided on? I mean, where are they getting the data? I mean, and I'm a big, huge follower of International Food Information Council. I use their stats all the time, so I'm glad that you and I are on the same boat on that because it's they've put some great stuff out there, but you and I are talking about it before the show and I saw Jennifer Garner on the tele, you know, on TV, you know, talking about Kentucky and the devastation with the floods that they had and food insecurity. So we look at these trends and some of them seem very, I don't want to say high highfalutin, but not for the marketplace for necessarily everybody. Yes. So can you touch on that a little bit? And I'm not bad mouthing any of these brands, you know, cause they're, but how do we figure that out? Yeah. So, so first of all, to the first part of your question, I would say the consumer is deciding, Mm -hmm. you know, the consumer is behind the trends in the past. I think, you know, restaurants would start in fine dining where um, restaurant chefs would, would make something, it would gain traction and then it would sort of become more mainstream and then it would emerge into packaged food. And that's like sort of the trajectory that a trend would follow. And now I think, you know, it's social media. Honestly, I think a lot of conversations being had online mm-hmm. are driving a lot of the the discussions behind some of this innovation. And but, I, I mean, all the brands I talked about today, they're emerging, they're premium. Mm-hmm. They're certainly not going to scale to like the masses. And it's, right. it's certainly not something that somebody who's struggling with food insecurity would you know, be exposed to. And so I do want to be very clear whenever I talk about trends that these are like sort of the emerging kind of on the fringe cutting edge trends and not reflective of the American or global population of, you know, how people eat. Right. But yeah, I get, does that answer? The yeah, question? it does. I mean, and, it, and it's hard because I, I talk about trends. I'm like, these are the people coming to your meetings and these are the people coming to your restaurants and, you know, what are they looking for? And so I think restaurateurs, and food service comp- people are seeing this yeah. across the board, but it also, we have to figure out, you know, and I love the fact that everybody's looking at food waste because that is one of our biggest challenges to be able to feed everybody in the world. So it's, it's great that the trends are kind of coming to converging in that, in that conversation. It's just, it's hard to see sometimes too. Right. Right. So what makes a good disruptor in this in this marketplace? I mean, 
I, yeah. How do you, how do they do that? And getting on shark tank and talking about this and getting Mark Cuban to say, Hey, here's my money. Right. Sure. So I think it boils down to a few things. I think disruptive innovation and really innovation in general. And I'll back up and say that I think the word innovation gets overused sometimes Mm -hmm. and applied to things like product line extensions or reformulations or packaging updates. And those are really important things for a company to have in their portfolio and it adds incremental growth. But I don't consider that necessarily innovative. I just consider that product development. So I think to to make that distinction is important. So when I think about innovation and, and even taking a step further, what's disruptive, it needs to add value to a consumer's lives. Mm -hmm. And like ideally on a repeat basis. So you need to be able to buy it again and again and again. It needs to be differentiated. And unlike anything else in the marketplace, it needs to fill a gap in the consumer's life. It needs to be well-timed because I think sometimes some of these innovators, especially some of the emerging brands that um, we've talked about might be kind of early. And, you know, like when I think about like insect protein, for example, It's a promising idea. It has a lot of sustainability benefits and some nutritional benefits. But a lot of consumers, a lot of American consumers are still really squeamish about that Mm -hmm. idea. And so I think it's not, you know, any early efforts in that area have not been well-timed. I think it might take a little bit more time Mm -hmm. for for mainstream acceptance of that. And then it needs to be scalable, you know, because the coolest idea in the world isn't viable unless you can commercialize and scale it. Right. It needs to be accessible to your target consumer in price and availability. And I think, especially now with all the supply chain challenges, you it needs to be simple. I think that, you know, we have a tendency to overthink innovation, you know, or look at examples of people who are doing some really cool, crazy tech things and then getting a lot of funding to do it. But really, I think a lot of successful innovation is simple and, and relatively easy to achieve, you know, especially in a challenging operating environment. Yeah. And I think, you know, in, in what exactly what you said and what we're seeing in the marketplace across the board and, you know, tankers still holding, not tankers, but boats still holding cargoes of food product and clothing product and, and out there, it is a challenge, but then the prices of food at this, at this moment too, is a huge factor as well. And if you can, I think some of these people, if you can utilize your local farmers, right. Or do something different with that, I think it really will help boost a variety of different ways, right? Sure. Now, one of these things too is, and I remember seeing, I was so excited. This was years ago. Mary's Gone, not Mary's Gone Crackers, but Mary's, it was the little cakes. They were at, not Mary's, gluten-free cakes. Oh, I'm going to forget it. Or is it Mary? I, anyways, I was so excited to see them in a in a hotel sundry shop, right? And so my point, my question to you is, is all these trends and, and when I walk through natural products expo, I'm thinking about it from the meetings perspective, right? How can I get it on a break, you know, a break buffet? How can I get it on the breakfast buffet? And when I talk to this, a lot of them, granted, they're all new, you know, they're up and coming, being innovative. They're like food service. What are you talking about? Right. So they're more of that retail side of it, getting into the grocery stores. Do they need that first to be able to get in to the food service side or can we work it around? How do we get them into food service? I actually think, and this is based on a lot of conversations I've had with, with startup founders Mm -hmm. is that food service, somebody that I talked to recently called it the golden channel because it's high margin. It -hmm. allows a company to be profitable, like years ahead of, of like, people who go that that traditional retail path. Uh-huh. And anymore, I think a lot of companies start direct to consumer. And that's really important, not just because the barrier to entry is a lot lower than retail, but also, and, and also the margins are better, but, but also it's a way to sort of test and iterate a concept early. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it's kind of more like, it's like dipping your toe in, right. to like be able to put a product out there, engage with your biggest fans, figure out if this is the messaging that you want to put out there, figure out if this is the, the formulation that people like, and then go from there. Okay. So I, th- I think anymore, that's the traditional path. I think retail is almost like the last resort for a lot of people because it is so expensive. Right. And it's, it's resource intensive because, you know, I mean, you got to be 
on the store level, checking your your display, checking your right. facings That's and making true. sure that everything mm-hmm. is how it should be. And a lot of these chains, you know, there's just so many buyers and, and people to interface with and brokers and distributors. So anymore, I think, especially now that we're in a post-pandemic place and meetings mm-hmm. are resuming and, you know, food service opportunities beyond like traditional restaurant, but like, you know, corporate offices are reopening and things that, you know, ways that consumers might interact with a brand outside of the grocery store or online. Right. Those opportunities are super important and, and really lucrative, honestly, to, to yeah. brands, especially early stage brands that are bootstrapping their companies. Well, and, and I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, who's a member of Ladoms and she was talking to somebody like, okay, they asked her, so how many truckloads are you going to bring? And she's like, my little, you know, delivery truck, it's not going to be an 18 wheeler, right? Because she's still just one person. And so it is figuring that out. And, and, and she's bootstrapping it and getting her product into a variety of different things. And she's got blueberry sauce and curd, lemon curd and, and some freaking delicious pound cakes. But well, I say delicious, I haven't eaten them because they're not gluten free, but Everybody else raves about them. But yeah, it is thinking about that way. But it reminds me of a session that I heard at Cater Source a couple of months ago. And it was the executive chef. He was the executive chef at the time of the Georgia International Conference Center in Atlanta. And he stopped using his national purchasing thing and went direct to farmer. And he was able to help farmers buy new trucks. And, and I love that going directly to the source of getting that. And, but then how he helped elevate those small businesses, right. To give them that stepping stone to get four new contracts because of their relationship with that. And so I think that's a little, that plays into some of the things that you were saying, because it is really important and you don't think about it. You don't think about a sundry shop at a hotel, but it's a great, to me, it's a great way to show off a local product. I agree. Yes. And, you know, I, I actually had an experience recently where I was at a hotel and, and was really su- pleasantly surprised by the assortment and, and had a lot of fun looking at all of the options. But the thing that I ended up picking up there was one of the upcycled oh, brands. Yeah? I don't think I discussed, but it's called Confetti Snacks and they use like ugly mushroom or like rejected or irregular produce in their Udgy chips. And it's not like a one of those sort of extruded vegetable chips that just looks like a, you know, like a fry or something, but it's Mm -hmm. actually like you see the actual vegetables and the beautiful colors and, you know, they're seasoned, but, but they're vegetables that normally would have gone to waste. And and I think that's just really huge. And hopefully that hotels and chefs are doing, making their own chips out of the same kind of products, you know, right. Why not? Right. Yeah. So you mentioned before the show that you had a friend who had an allergic reaction. Yes. At a restaurant. Can you tell that story and what happened? Yeah. So I was at a a client dinner a few months ago and the individual, I I didn't know him very well before. I didn't know him at all before the dinner, but he had made the reservation and it was a a nice steakhouse here in Kansas Mm -hmm. City. And he called ahead and said, you know, I think they asked, is anybody in your party? Does anybody in your party have food allergies? And he said, yes, I have a peanut allergy. And they noted that. And then when it came time to order, because this individual is vegan, he got the one vegan item at the steakhouse, (laughs) which turned out to be like an eggplant with tempeh type dish, Mm -hmm. you know, looked at it on the menu, looked, you know, sounded like something appetizing and he ordered it. And a few bites in, he could tell something wasn't quite right. And so he asked the server, are there peanuts in this dish? And the server's like, I don't know. Let me check. And the manager came and confirmed that there were peanuts in the tempeh. That was, it was a peanut sauce or peanut based tempeh. It wasn't disclosed on the menu. So I think that's the, the problem. Number one, the mm-hmm. fact that the no allergens were disclosed on the menu. And I realized that it, it adds a lot of words and things that may not make a menu look so pretty, but I think it's really important that mm-hmm. all, I mean, just table stakes, like disclose top eight or nine allergens on menus for each dish. So the manager did not have an EpiPen available. The, my fellow diner also did not have an EpiPen with him. Not that it should have been his responsibility, but right. so the way that it was handled was his, his meal was comped and the manager offered to call an ambulance. And he ended up, the, my, the 
my fellow diner ended up being okay, mostly. Right. I mean, he had a, a pretty rough night, as you can imagine, but he he was okay. And then he did call the restaurant afterwards and explain the experience and just said, you know, maybe take into consideration the fact that you made a reservation. You took down the fact that there was a peanut allergy. You mm -hmm. still served me a dish with peanuts. You didn't disclose it on the menu and you weren't really adequately prepared to, you know, address, right. yeah. address the situation. So yeah. And that it's interesting that you said the thing about the EpiPen not being, they didn't have one and places of public accommodation like restaurants and hotels and convention centers are able to stock them in 30, I think it's 36 states right now, oh. give the ability for places of public accommodation to actually get EpiPens. And, and you have to have somebody on staff that's able to administer. It has been through training of it, but it, it does get a little bit pricey, especially when they have to be renewed every year and hopefully you're not having to use them in your restaurant sure. for the fact that you potentially have them. But yeah, I mean, in a, next, the next, the next couple of weeks, I'm talking about that food safety aspect of it. What can, you know, food service providers do to create that safety space. Right. But it is the challenge of it too, is the labeling. And we were talking to about some new labeling that I saw at the whole foods in Wilmington, North Carolina, when I just a couple of weeks last week, I was there and, you know, this made without gluten ingredients is the way that they're putting that on the hot bar. And, and we were chatting about the using gluten free and, and when you take it out of the bag, it doesn't make it gluten free anymore. Right. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand sort yeah. of dancing around the language a little bit as a way to sort of cover yourself because, right. you know, now that the FDA for, I think the last maybe eight years now right. has had a sort of a definition for gluten-free mm -hmm. and a, a standard of how facilities producing gluten-free foods, parts per million and all of that. Right. stuff. Whereas before it was just kind of like made without gluten was gluten-free and now we have right. certification around it. And so I can see a, a operator being careful about how they label those mm -hmm. products. And, and I, I mean, if you're, you know, celiac, like you really have to like, even any kind of contamination, like is right. a problem, you know, if you have a gluten allergy, but if it touched bread, you know, like that's right. different, but you can't make an assumption of, of the right. user's, you know, situation. Yeah, exactly. And I think we saw a lot of those products. It, 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 it does make it a challenge, the labeling of it and, but the consistency of it. And we know that you're not a hundred percent allergen free and, or a hundred percent gluten free ex environment, but there are steps that you can take to do that. And I think a lot of these products too, that are coming out as well, finding dedicated facilities. And that's a challenge, you know, going that we have to face as well when they put made in a facility of, you know, that also processes this, this, and this and vice versa. So, well, all right, we're not, we came here to talk about trends, but food allergy trends, food allergy is one of the biggest trends. And that was a lot of the products actually at the natural products expo or expo West that we saw as well. One of the so let's step away from that a little bit one second and talk about regenerative agriculture mm -hmm. because that to me was a huge push mm -hmm. at Expo West as well. And I seeing a lot of it on the news and, you know, do you see a lot of products that are promoting that and how can, you know, the meetings industry get in on that? Is there a way? So um, I believe there's a, a there's been a new standard introduced and it's regenerative okay. organic i want to say or okay. yeah regenerative organic certified roc i had just learned about that right before expo west i okay. don't know of a lot of brands that are using it cuz i think it is a relatively new third party certification uh -huh. um, i think so i think a lot of what's happening is a lot of people are are sort of sourcing ingredients you know in different ways that might be mm -hmm. regeneratively grown right and, and kind of piecemealing that message together. I think it's the supply chain isn't advanced enough to be able to make something that has 100% regeneratively grown ingredients. Right. I think we have, you know, some, some a ways to go with that. We're seeing big companies that are investing, General Mills being one of the leaders in that, investing in regenerative agriculture. And then, you know, some, some smaller companies that don't have that kind of scale are incorporating those ingredients into their into their formulations and messaging that on the pack. But I mean, I think that it's, it's really, it's, you know, like we talked about upcycling a lot, but regenerative agriculture is another really important 
yeah, part of the the you know mitigating climate change and the responsibility mm-hmm. that the food industry has to advance those efforts. Yeah. Well, and I was I just started listening and I bought the book by Mark Hyman, Food Fix. Hmm. And just listening to chapter one just fueled me from wanting to even do more of what I'm doing, you know, because of the numbers and and how food impacts us. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it impacts us not just from the way we eat it, but it, and and actually the other day I was going through my podcast, my episode dropped yesterday and and, and I actually still need to ask you this question is, but what does safe, sustainable and inclusive food and beverage mean to you? And Brian from Bees in the D said, he's like, you typically think of food as just what's on your plate. He goes, but food goes all the way back to the beginning of the bees, you know? And so you really have to think about if you don't want chemicals on your plate, then are you thinking about them all the way through, Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought that was just an interesting answer to his, to the question because it is, it's really, really important to figure out. So, yeah, it's a really interesting point. Yeah. Cause you don't, you don't think about it. I mean, you open up a whatever bar or whatever package you eat. Do you think about, you know, how that came about? I think people do to a certain extent, but they don't go that far back. Right. You know, they might yeah. think about who is the person behind this or where was this ingredient grown? But I don't think that people are looking holistically at the entire supply chain or value chain behind each product they eat. And, you know, sometimes that message just isn't convenient. So you don't, you don't want to know, you just want to enjoy your food. Exactly. Yeah. I posted something, somebody posted that, you know, eating this way was going to be is better. And I forgot it was on, I posted on Instagram and somebody the comments below it, I'm like, I'm not giving up my cookies. I'm not giving up my McDonald's, you know, whatever. And it actually was a USA Today story. And I need to go find that again because I thought it was hysterical. Like even my friend Sarah replied to my story going, I'm not giving up my cookies. I'm like, okay. Yeah. I think if somebody were to tell me tomorrow that coffee like had massive health implications, I would Uh just be like, well, (laughs) I had a good run, (laughs) but nobody's taking my coffee away. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I think there comes a big balance in that figuring all of that out for all of us. So. Yeah. All right. So on that note, going back to that question, what mm-hmm. does safe, sustainable and inclusive mean to you personally and or from the, the role that you have? So I, I like, I kind of glom on the word inclusive mm-hmm. because I think that it kind of has several layers to it. I think when we think about allergen free, that's a big part of it. When I look at certain brands that are, you know, they, they build themselves as like top eight or top nine allergen free. I think a lot of people look at that as, oh, well, that's not for me. Cause I can, I can eat anything. I don't have any allergens, but I think what's important is the fact that these companies are making something that's delicious for everybody, regardless of whether it has mm-hmm. allergens or not. I think that that's a, the way that a lot of these companies are creating products now and formulating and marketing is like, this is for anybody who wants it. Like there's a company called Safe and Fair and they do popcorns and trail mixes and other snacks. I want to say top nine free, but it's like really fun flavors like birthday cake and honey crisp apple pie and things like that. So it's really appealing. It has mass appeal. It's not just for people who are seeking out this type of product. So I think like when we think about inclusive, we think about anybody can eat it Mm -hmm. because, you know, chances are, you know, somebody that you know, like are with or dining with has a food allergy. And, you know, I think table stakes, anybody who has an allergy should be, you know, should be able to eat sustainable. I think, you know, we talked about regenerative agriculture and, and upcycling and some of these other interesting innovations or sort of ways to measure, you know, impact in the industry have been emerging. And I think, you know, an interesting thing that, that hasn't really made a lot of, hasn't really gained a lot of traction is the concept of biodiversity and the fact that Mm -hmm. Americans only consume like 15 different plants and like five different species or something like that, like 80% of people's diets. I wish I had the exact stat because like maybe like on your next show, you can (laughs) can clarify this. Yeah, it's crazy. But the fact that there are so many amazing nutritious plants out there 
mm-hmm. that, you know, have these, these sustainability benefits, you know, soil fix or, you know, like nitrogen fixing, mm-hmm. carbon sequestration, you know, like all of the, the agricultural benefits, as well as the nutritious benefits that, you know, we're not always getting a good cross-section of nutrients in our diets when we eat the same things all the time. Right. And it also has implications for solving food insecurity and feeding a, a growing global population. So I think like, how, how do we unlock, you know, bringing more crops into our diets right. um, is a big one. And then, I mean, safe, I, I don't know, like you, you shouldn't have to question, you know, like, I guess it goes back to that food allergy thing, you know, mm-hmm. like, you, sh- you should be able to go and eat wherever you want and have that information readily available that will help you make that decision that's best for you. Right. Whether yeah. it's on the menu or in labeling, I just think that's really important. Oh, those are all really good points. And they, and I, they all mesh together in, in some sort of fashion. And it, it just, we, it's something that people need to think about a little bit more, to, you know, when they think about it, but and not take it so much for granted sometimes because we do and mm-hmm. we all do and it's okay. And even my mom, it's funny. Cause she went and we, we, she uses gluten-free pasta in the house so that I can eat it. But she, you know, so funny. She's like, Tracy, I got the, I got the pasta and I'm looking at it and I'm like, mom, this isn't the gluten-free. She's like, it's got the GMO, non-GMO logo <laughs> on it. <laughs> I'm like, uh, one, I'm heart. so glad that you know, you know, you picked it up for that reason. I'm like, I'm so proud of you, but it, it is, I got to go get the gluten-free one, <laughs> which is fine. And let's combine those two, right? You know, non-GMO and gluten-free too. So, but no, I so appreciate what you do and what you write about, because it is really important for these small businesses to get up and running and be innovative and, and help reach a market that's more inclusive in our food and beverage. And so thank you for doing that. And oh. I love it. It's so much fun. (laughs) Happy to do it. And well, okay. So if you wanted to go Miss Foodie, where do you want to go eat that you haven't eaten? So I actually don't go to a lot of restaurants, believe it or not. I actually like live in, so, so I would say I would go to Erewhon in Los Angeles, the really upscale (laughs) grocery chain and just like find a bunch of snacks and eat there. Yep. (laughs) I, Hey, I do the same thing because sometimes it's just fun to do that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Best way to kill a Sunday afternoon. (laughs) All right, Monica, thank you so much. And everybody, I posted it on here. You can connect with Monica at foodbusinessnews.net. You can also find her on LinkedIn. I have that address here and I will put that in the comments for you to, to reach out to her. But Monica, thank you so much about and talking to me today and the listeners about food trends and brands and disruptive innovation. Thank you. This was so much fun. It was very fun. Thank you. So again, thank you, Monica and everybody until next week, stay safe and eat well. Thanks for listening to the eating at a meeting podcast where every meal matters. I'm Tracy Stuckrath, your food and beverage inclusion expert. Call me and let's get started right now on creating safe and inclusive food and beverage experiences for your customers, your employees, and your communities. Share the podcast with your friends and colleagues at our Eating at a Meeting Facebook page and on all podcast platforms. To learn more about me and receive valuable information, go to tracystuckrath.com. And if you'd like more information on how to feed engagement, nourish inclusion, and bolster your bottom line, then visit eatingatameeting.com.